Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Alex was my second boss, Steve, at Continental Bank in Chicago. He hasn't recovered yet, Steve. <laughs> He taught me how to write, though, which was pretty good. I, I, <laughs> I'll right. never forget that. That was really good. We brought in the that's guy from huge, University that's... of Chicago. <laughs> I, and uh, I learned about nominalization. I want to do that. Um, okay, so let's get this going. Some of this might end up in a pre-show. Okay. Welcome to the Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. Well, it looks like the bill has finally come due for decades of reckless monetary, fiscal, and regulatory policy. After 40 years of relatively stable prices, we now have raging inflation caused by reckless federal spending. Interest rates have risen dramatically, and commercial banks are now sitting on more than $600 billion of unrealized bond losses. Silicon Valley, Signature, and First Republic banks look to be canaries in the coal mine, potentially the first of many regional bank balance sheets to blow up. Even the Federal Reserve is now losing money. Regulators have pulled out their default playbook, declaring more institutions systematically risky, hoisting the tab on taxpayers and giving regulators even more control. But there's also something new. The troubling problem of regulatory emission drift, the Fed's historical mandates are to promote price stability and full employment in a safe and sound banking system. Uh, but instead, the Fed and the Treasury have changed their priorities to promote the progressive policies of climate change and equity. Uh, moreover, the, the scenario playing out here could be leading towards something much worse, which would be central bank digital currencies. Uh, joining me to talk all this through is Alex Pollack and, and Steve Dewey, both uh, longtime grizzled, grizzled, grizzled veterans of the banking and regulatory world. Uh, Alex is senior fellow at the Mises Institute and was principal deputy director of the Office of Financial Research of the U.S. Treasury Department in 2019 and 2020, through 2021. He's an author of a couple of great books, Finance and Philosophy, why we're always surprised, and co-author Surprised Again, the, the COVID crisis and the new market bubble, which is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Steve Dewey worked for several years in Asia during the Asian financial crisis with top U.S. investment groups, including GE Capital and Goldman Sachs. Later, he worked for the FDIC during and after the 2008 financial crisis, where he was involved in the resolution of failed banks and help create Dodd-Frank resolution plans for global financial institutions. Didn't we call those living wills, guys? Yes, living wills. Yep. <laughs> well, well, Alex, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the first shot at this. Uh, Alex has seniority here because he was my my second boss when I was in the commercial banking business. Gosh, Alex, almost almost 50 years ago, 45 years ago. It's been a long time. And then Alex later on. Uh, was a member of my board at uh, Allied Capital Corporation and helped guide me through uh, our own excitement during the 2008 uh, financial meltdown. So Alex and, uh, and uh, Steve, welcome. Alex, thoughts? Thank you, Bill. I'm great to be with you uh, on the show, Steve. I think something you said there is really uh, important, Bill, which is we are still uh, living in the aftermath of the long uh, manipulation of interest rates and financial markets by the Federal Reserve, but also by the club of central banks. Uh, the central banks operate together. Uh, they talk each other into the same ideas. They they display cognitive hurting and behavioral hurting, and the and the vast expansion uh, of of money and suppression of interest rates uh, to abnormally low levels was done as a cooperative venture by all these central banks and now we're seeing the results uh in in our book surprised again we call that central banking to the max uh, <laughs> and 
and like to point out that although creation of money may seem free in the beginning, as the uh, proponents of the so-called modern monetary theory, which is actually the least modern of any monetary theory, theory namely, if you need money, print it up, uh, that has a long history. Um, uh, in spite of the fact they feel like that's free, it's not free, nothing in economics is free, and you pay the price. We're now paying the price uh, in high inflation, in, in the deflation of the asset price bubbles, uh, which the uh, central banks together and the Fed in particular uh, uh, inflated. Uh, and now the, the uh, stresses that you pointed out, Bill, in the, in the banking system. I'll, I'll just mention one last thing, which is, uh, as somebody uh, has correctly written, the Federal Reserve's own balance sheet looks just like the balance sheet of Silicon Valley Bank. That is to say, a huge number of long-term fixed-rate assets. Well, I'll let, I'll let, you, I'll let, I'll let Steve liability. jump in, but let, yeah. let me interject <laughs> this. The, 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 the Treasury issued almost $8 trillion of uh, bonds, Yeah, and the Fed bought half. And the commercial banks bought the other half. I may have the numbers. I think it may be a little bit less, but that's ballpark. Yes. That meant when the commercial banks, they bought these bonds that they were yielding one, one and a half, two percent. Now that interest rates are four, four and a half, five percent, they're sitting on, that's where the unrealized losses come, 600 million. The Fed has the same- Billion, problem. excuse me, billion. Billions, yeah. Who, who's keeping track? Ever, <laughs> Ever Dirksen, where, where are you? Uh, <laughs> But, but the Fed has the same problem with its balance sheet. They were buying these bonds at the same low interest rates, and they've got the same unrealized losses. Correct. They have vast unrealized losses. Their last published numbers are an unrealized loss of 1.1 trillion. That now we're up to the T, the trillion. Uh, that was as of the end of September. Uh, and since September, interestingly, the Fed itself has lost 42 billion dollars in the last six months, uh, which just happens to be the amount of their capital, 42 billion. So they've run through their whole capital uh, in losses over the last six months. It's very interesting. This, uh, So we have the same pattern, which you would have thought of, and I'm sure Steve's going back to your FDIC days, as the most fundamental financial mistake you could make, mistakes made by, let's say, the savings and loans around 1980 or so. It was made both by the commercial banking system, led by, uh, led by the Federal Reserve, and as I said before, all the other central banks as well. So they all have this same problem. Just a last note, uh, Bill, is it's not only it's not only bonds and mortgage-backed securities that cause the problem in the banking system. It's also fixed-rate loans because a lot of banks loaded up again, just like an SNL in the 1970s on 30 year fixed rate mortgages at the top of the market created by the Fed, which is the bottom of yields. And they have huge losses uh, on their loan portfolio, interest rate risk losses on their loan portfolio, as well as on their bond portfolios. Uh, one recent uh, estimate of the total losses of including both loans and bonds is two tr about two trillion, someplace between 1.7 and $2 trillion. So Steve, I want you to jump in here. We've given you a lot to work with. Uh, Thank you, Bill. <laughs> we're, we're playing, we're playing jazz. What, what thoughts, re reflections, where are we? Well, uh, regarding the, you know, the, uh, the two recent uh, big bank failures, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, um, I'd like to um, I'd like to get into macro causes. And you wrote the, a, you wrote about that in uh, what the Federalist or where, where, where uh, the American, American Spectator. The American Spectator. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's also republished in uh, uh, Fee Fee uh, Foundation for Economic Education. It's also sure appears there. But anyway, um, I broke down broke it down um, from a macro perspective as well as a micro perspective with the uh, specific banks. So looking first at the, um, from a macro perspective, as, as Alex was uh, just talking about, um, the Federal Reserve definitely uh, 
was a huge factor in what happened with uh, having this uh, zero rate or near zero rate interest, in, near zero interest rate policy for so long. I mean, it had uh, it fed, fed funds rate near zero for uh, really since about 2008. Wasn't it almost, wasn't it almost 14 years we've had it? Yes, yeah, from 2008 to to uh, about 2000, what? I think. 22. 22, yeah, just last year. Yeah, well, so they... yeah, it kind of jumped up a little bit uh, in the latter part of the Trump administration. Then it started, then it came right back down to zero. So for most of the last 15 years, it's been near zero. And then in addition to that, there's been an enormous increase in the money supply, but especially and uh, from March of 2020 to March 2022, that two-year period, the M2 money supply increased 41%. So <laughs> when you combine that and explosive growth in the M2 money supply with the near 0% interest rate policy, obviously you're going to have inflation. The, you know, it's got it's to result in inflation. And so um, that is sort of a, the, you know, the, the, I would say a macro cause is, that's, uh, that's causing the, you know, problems with the entire banking sector, the entire banking well, sector. See, it seems like bankers, you know, there's, the, there's the narcotic effect of having the luxury of paying zero interest on your deposits for 14 years. And bankers forgot how to be bankers. And they forgot risk management, duration, all the sort of the fundamental stuff that. Uh, yeah, that yeah, it, it, yeah. It causes speculative, more speculative behavior by the banks, and uh, it kind of lulls them into a, a false sense of security. Um, but there's another interesting. Uh, May I just interrupt there to remind yeah, sure. you of the definition of a prudent banker? This is paraphrasing John Maynard Keynes. A prudent banker is a banker who goes broke when everybody else goes broke. <laughs> well, I like the one. <laughs> but here, I like the one, the Walter Badgett one, Alex, that you used in your article. It says, a banker dealing with the money of others and money payable on demand must always, as it were, looking behind him and seeing that he has reserve enough in store of payment should be asked for. Uh, adventure is the life of commerce but caution is the life of banking. Indeed, <laughs> or it should be. <laughs> Steve, I, I, we keep in our, sure, Alex Steve, and I have sure. been interrupting <laughs> you, each other for five decades, so you just jump in. <laughs> yeah, uh, and actually um, there's another really, uh, I, I find a really interesting uh, macro perspective that uh, I think could be a cause behind the, the, the banking problems we're seeing now. And this was uh, brought up by uh, Tom Honig, uh, I'm sure you know Tom Honig, the former um, head of the Kansas City Fed, and he was also vice chair of the FDIC for for five years, and he's now at the Mercatus Center. Um, he brought up a really interesting point, which I haven't really seen anyone else talk about. He was talking about how uh, the regulatory regimes, and I think this came from the Basel uh, uh, that uh, talking about this uh, sort of uh, regulatory devised uh, capital ratios. And he mentions about the- um, Oh yeah. The tier one capital ratio- No is longer measured with real money. Yes, is uh, something that was devised by Basel and by the, the central banks around the world. And he was saying that uh, this is a kind of a really misleading capital ratio that the regulators are really focused on. And he said um, that if you really focus on real market realistic, yeah. tangible capital to asset ratio, it paints a much different picture. So in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, for example, he was saying the, uh, the regulatory capital ratio that the regulators look at had Silicon Valley Bank at uh, 16%. But if you look at the more realistic, uh, tangible capital to asset ratio, it was only about 5%. And I thought that was a really interesting point. Yeah. Alex, you know a lot about that. Well, if in addition to that, you mark the assets to market at zero, <laughs> right. as, as they found out. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, my screen froze up here a second. Could you, what'd you say, Alex? 
I said, in addition, if you marked Silicon Valley's uh, assets to market, then the capital became zero. That's actually just marking the bonds to market. Yeah. So, yeah. so what is capital? Is it, is something of a political question? I think it's fair to say. Yeah, and that's a, that's a point that uh, that Tom Honig was making in an article he wrote uh, about that. That uh, these capital ratios that have been devised by the regulators are really driven more by politics than by you know the real than by the market. Well, that's something that we ought to talk about because the the regulatory regime is not the regulatory regime it was 50 years ago. There's a whole new breed of people op occupying those jobs. And if you look at the rest of federal government, it's all, <laughs> I think most of most of the employees in federal government voted for Joe Biden overwhelmingly. And they've, they've, they've weaponized the whole of government focused on a climate agenda and, a, uh, and an equity agenda to, to just boil it down to the essential. And you know it's infected all the agencies. If you look at the Treasury strategic plan that Janet Yellen has up there, I think there are five objectives for the Treasury, and three of them involve climate, diversity, uh, and equity. And I don't think they've even got a single of the top five objectives that has much to do about the the uh, you know stability of the dollar or the uh, the uh, dollar's reserve currency status in the world. They just sort of assume that'll always be there, and they can. They can play diversity uh, uh, agendas, uh, I guess, while Rome burns. You said equity. I'd call it so-called equity. But well, yeah. 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 I wrote something, <laughs> diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, three words that mean in their hands exactly the opposite of what they mean, <laughs> that are exactly the opposite. Uh, yeah. let's, let's, let's Orwellian just, let, me, let me jump in here for a promo. This is the Bill Walton Show, and I'm here with Alex Pollack and Steve Dewey, uh, veterans of the banking and regulatory world, and we're talking about where we are right now with Silicon Valley and the other banks and the Federal Reserve. And uh, I, guess, I guess the question I have here is the core issue for the banks that failed was poor management, dura management of duration, um, which is they had long maturities and, and short short duration liabilities or long assets, short duration liabilities. And it seems like that problem exists not just in those banks, but most of the regional banks uh, in the country. I think that's right. In the banking system in general, obviously with a distribution uh, of various ratios. Uh, but if you would look at the at the uh, say the bot, there are about uh, something over 4,000, 4,400 banks, 4,000 banks. Uh, I guess if you would look at the uh, at the uh, lower one quarter or let's say 1,000 banks with, that have the, the, the highest mismatch, the biggest mismatch that way, it would be pretty sobering, I guess. And yeah, said, you've been before, you got you, you got to count loans as well as securities. Yeah, Steve, what do you think? Yeah, uh, I think there's definitely a duration risk throughout the entire banking sector, just simply because of how quickly the the Fed has raised the Fed funds rate. Uh, there's got to be uh, I don't know what. Well, the the uh, the figure that uh, Alex mentioned about. Uh, unrealized losses points to that problem with the duration risk because a lot a lot of banks have these uh you know longer term bonds even supposedly credit risk free u.s treasuries or mortgage-backed securities um that are 10 years in term and they're being affected by these uh you know sudden increases in the uh, interest rates so so i'm sure that that's a problem throughout the entire banking sector so what about the issues of the uninsured deposits? Could, could I, Bill, can I just jump in with one more thought there? Sure. If you, on, on, the, uh, on, the, mis on the interest rate <laughs> mismatch, uh, in, the, uh, in, the in the compendium of favorite sayings in uh, finance and philosophy, you find risk is the price you never thought you'd have to pay. I think it's quite, I think this uh, applies quite well. The, this interest rate mismatch risk is one that management surely knew they had 
but they never thought they'd have to pay such a price. You could imagine you know, how high and how fast can, can short-term interest rates increase. You could imagine running a lot of scenarios where they increase some, but nowhere near the, the 450 basis points. They have gone up, or four and a half percent. So if you look at the Federal Reserve itself, for example, uh, in March 2021, so just before uh, a, a year before the big interest rate run-up started, they, the Federal Reserve itself, the Open Market Committee, projected that at the end of 2022, short-term interest rates would be 0.1%. <laughs> so they were off by 4.5%. And you can imagine a lot of people knowing they had a position, but never not being able to bring themselves to take seriously enough to act on it, uh, how much their position might move against them, four and a half percent. Taking interest rates, uh, I will say, not to a high level, only to a normal level. Four and a half to five percent short-term rates are historically normal level of interest rates in this country. Well, well, so all you had to imagine was going back to normal. Well, but but Alex, you don't do have a PhD from MIT. Thank goodness, yes. I mean, the, everybody that graduates from MIT's economic program, doctoral program, goes to the Fed. And they all <laughs> think they all think the same thing, and they've got they've got their models, and their mo and they've never worked in the private sector. They've never managed a balance sheet of their own, and. Uh, there's never been a Fed model that predicted anything correctly, I think, in the last 100 years. Am I, That's am right. I being, am I being harsh here? I don't, I don't think I'm being I mean. realistic. The financial yeah. future, no matter how smart you are, is fundamentally unknowable. One of the themes of my books, uh, no matter who you are, including the central bank. And so we get. But, but, here, but here's the problem. It's like a public. I don't know where the public choice is. But here's the funny thing. If you did go to MIT and you did get a PhD in, in monetary economics and you did know how to predict interest rates, I don't think you'd go to work for the Fed. You'd set up a hedge fund. Well, if you could do it. And make a couple billion dollars. Yeah, yeah if, you, if you really yeah, could. Yeah, Bill, I wanted, I wanted to mention the one thing about this uh, duration risk that we've been talking about. Uh, that was not apparently not even included in the Fed's stress tests. <laughs> it, which is <laughs> pretty remarkable. They were, you know, in their stress tests that they uh, they have the the larger banks uh, provide. Uh, they were testing for other things, but one of the things they did not even test at all is duration risk, and that's what brought down uh, both the two regional banks. Financial crises are blindside hits on the quarterback, on the financial quarterback. You're looking downfield someplace else not at that 280 pound guy that's about to knock you down. Yeah, yeah and apparently these stress tests were, were uh, factoring in, you know, the risk of uh, climate change. But yes. Not, but not duration risk. But, but not interest rates. Right. <laughs> well, but I've, we've got to memorialize that. It was climate risk, but not duration. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's, that's certainly not the banking I learned. Uh, but let me ask a, a bigger question something I want is, is the Fed really in charge here? I mean, we talk about the Fed suppressing interest rates and the other monetary authorities doing that, but how much of that was just the manipulation by the monetary authorities? And were there any market forces at work now? Or, or, or let me ask the question another way. The Fed, if it was successful in suppressing short-term rates for a long time and long-term rates, has the genie now come out of the bottle and they can't really control anything? Have they lost control of this at this point? Well, I think there is so much inertia built up over the their policy, zero interest rate or near zero interest rate policy for the last 15 years and the enormous increase in the money supply. I think there's so much inertia built in to what has occurred that it's going to be difficult to sort of reverse that. That's that's the well. Uh, put another way, the friend of mine, Robert Mono, was on the show last week. He writes for uh, Americans for Limited Government. He's really brilliant on the financial scene. And the title of one of his pieces was "Has the 
has the US banking system become too big to save? And, you know, we've got what, $17 trillion of deposits. And I think I heard Janet Yellen last week declare that those were all going to be in de facto in insured by the uh, by the Treasury and the Fed and the FDIC. And what's what's the FDIC having assets of about 270 billion? Um, they're a little well, short of the 17 trillion. Their deposit insurance fund is around, uh, I think it's currently about 128 billion. That's, that's what I was going to say. 128, so not even as much as I thought. Oh, no. But they also have the ability to, to, uh, to assess all of the banks uh, to build up their fund. So you have a, the whole uh, deposit insurance fund in the extreme case is a way of, it, just as the original opponents of deposit insurance in the 1930s and before said, it's a way to assess the careful, prudent banks to pay for the mistakes of the uncareful, imprudent ones. That's true, but that, that itself has limits. So you find out when we're in a real crisis, there are all kinds of other bailouts like the TARP, famous TARP uh, bailout uh, in uh, 2008 and special, uh, bailout, say, for Citicorp uh, every every cycle. Uh, I think it's a fair uh, speculation that without those other balance sheets, you would have broke the federal, the FDIC had it really tried to cover all the losses that there were, had those losses not been covered by lots of other special deals, by, uh, by guarantees, by, uh, by capital injections. So, it's really the the whole apparatus of but, the central bank and the government. Well, listening to this, Alex, haven't we gone to this world where we had private sector actors managing their own risk, their own balance sheets, and if you had millions of them doing that, you had a fairly stable system. I mean, some failed, some succeeded wildly, but the, the risk kind of worked itself out among all the micro actors. Now we've got a grandiose federal government led by Janet Yellen and and I guess Jay Powell as well, is they're saying basically they're going to underwrite and guarantee all the risks in the banking system. And they don't, have, you know, maybe they can find enough people to assess uh, deposit uh, guarantee insurance on, but I doubt it. I mean, if you look at what it would really take to do that, it would, they wouldn't be doing anything except paying for deposit insurance. I mean, the grandiosity of what they're doing uh, it just seems so unmoored from the banking reality that that uh, all three of us grew up in. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the other thing that's interesting about the what happened with Silicon Valley Bank when uh, when the failure was announced on March, I think the date was March the tenth. Uh, the initial announcement was that uninsured depositors would not be covered, and then the FDIC did a hundred and eighty degree turnaround, a complete reversal, yeah. just 48 hours later saying, oh, now, uh, by the way, we're now going to cover all uninsured depositors. So they did a complete flip-flop on the issue of covering uninsured depositors. So I think that raises an issue. Uh, now, apparently there were conversations between the federal regulators, uh, the FDIC and the, and the Fed. With Steve, the let me just put a couple numbers on it. Of their deposits, only 10% were insured. Yes. The other 90% were uninsured. Or yes, 12, approximately. You know, approximately 10, 12% insured, something like that. But that the vast majority were were uninsured. deposits were uninsured and they were held by very wealthy venture capital firms and or the capital that venture capital firms had put into their investee companies. Right, right. And uh, uh, the uh, latest number that I have on the, the amount of the uninsured deposits was, uh, and this is, I think, from the uh, year end uh, 2022, was $151 billion. I don't know what the latest number the final number was, but at year end, it was $151 billion of uninsured deposits. Now, some got out, some got out before the failure, but yes. Yeah, right, right. Uh, but what, that tell, 
But, but what, what I wanted to touch on was in that 48 hour time period, when they did a complete reversal on their policy of covering, not covering and then covering uninsured deposits, apparently there were conversations with the Biden White House. So was there political pressure from the Biden White House put on the federal regulators to do a complete reversal on their policy on covering uninsured deposits? One can certainly speculate on the phone calls that they were getting. Yeah. From large contributors who were also large depositors in Silicon yeah. Valley Bank. Yeah. Now, another, another really important uh, point about what happened, um, and this was reported, believe it or not, by a very left wing uh, news source, The Intercept. Um, the Intercept reported that uh, of all of that money, all of, of, of all that the uninsured, all that the uninsured deposit money that was uh, covered, um, at least five accounts were held by Gavin Newsom or, or associated with Gavin Newsom. Governor of California, yeah. Uh, uh, apparently three of those accounts were corporate accounts uh, of Gavin Newsom's uh, winery companies owned by Gavin Newsom. Now, they did not know or did not report, I guess they probably didn't know, the amounts of those deposits. So, you know, this, uh, this, so the point is it kind of reeks of uh, sort of a, well, but, but it does. I mean, it, it, it's clear the partisanship here is, is naked. I mean, First Republic and also in California has got a similar deposit base and they're all, they're all Democrat donors. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking in Silicon I Valley's case, maybe only Peter, before, maybe Bill, only Peter you, Thiel. What's that? I'm sorry, Bill. You, I was going to say before, when you said the secretary of the treasury did this and that with the Fed and, yeah. I was going to add that in political reality, secretaries of the Treasury don't do such things without conversations with the White House. Yeah. So there's a White House connection. Well, that would sure. be when there's this kind I'm not, of. I'm not so sure whether. Okay, well, maybe, but that is, we do have <laughs> Joe Biden in there, so <laughs> I'm not so but, sure how tuned he was into this but, one, but maybe. But, but, uh, but just in the White House, let's say. <laughs> but just to finish my point on, uh, you know, the political, uh, apparent political connections uh, with this, you know, uninsured deposit uh, policy, um, I'm kind of surprised that the Republicans in the Congress have not brought this up as, uh, you know, as potential political corruption. Because they just had two hearings, they just had. Well, you you hearings. you attended the hearings. What 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 happened in the hearings? Well, it three, was, you had uh, the three regulators. You had the the FDIC and you had the Fed, and and, and what, the control of the currency. No, the uh, it was a uh, deputy secretary for Treasury, Nelly Liang. Okay, all right. And then uh, there was Michael Barr, who's the vice chair for regulation and supervision for the Fed. And uh, Martin Gruenberg, who's the chairman of the FDIC. So those those are the three the three panelists being being questioned. So um, I think the you know the 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 hearings were almost kind of, I, I would say almost kind of predictable because the Democrats were putting all the blame on the banks the the, the bank management and not really much blame on the regulators because they were the, you know the Democrats of course they're calling for even more regulation. Uh, and then on the Republican side, uh, the Republicans were much, much tougher on the regulators that, uh, you know, there was, uh, you know, uh, deficiencies in the regulatory oversight. Well, the Federal Reserve, uh, the San Francisco office was the, I guess, the regulator of Silicon Valley. Right. And uh, they just gone through a regulatory review and and they got outstanding marks from the San Francisco Fed. Um, for its uh, climate and diversity initiatives. <laughs> and there's, there's no evidence that they looked at the balance sheet risks at all. And so, and this is where I get back to the, the people in these regulatory agencies are not the above the fray dispassionate actors. They're, they're right in there with, uh, with, uh, with a woke agenda, I fear. And I uh, there's no question that the regulatory agencies have uh, have been uh, uh, infiltrated with that, 
Uh, and it's also the case that no one, when it comes down to financial markets uh, and, their and their tendency to get themselves in trouble, on average, once every 10 years, Bill, you will remember, uh, Walter Badgett, the great uh, British uh, writer on banking, who also happened to be the partner of a very successful private bank himself, pointed out they were having financial crises once every 10 years. Uh, and we have since the 1970s, once every 10 years, those that we have all ourselves lived through. Uh, but when that happens, no one is outside the fray. The Federal Reserve, the, uh, all the regulators, all of the bankers, all of the commentators, all of the rating agencies who also don't look good in these uh, recent, uh, recent failures. They're all inside the fray. No one is outside. Everyone is inside. And that's why no one really uh, can, can know what's going to happen. Uh, and, and no one can control it, including all of the regulators. Uh, yep. But I think it's fair to say that this, these mistakes were so basic that both the managements and the regulators should, should have clearly known. But but they didn't. They were thinking about other things, as you point out. Yeah, uh, Bill, the other thing that's uh, really amazing um, with re respect to Silicon Valley Bank, the CEO of Silicon Valley Bank, his name was uh, Greg Becker. I, I believe that's the name, Greg Becker. He not only was he CEO of Silicon Valley Bank, he was also sitting on the board of directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how that, how that happens. Well, you I mean, you're <laughs> politically popular <laughs> bankers and you let them be elected to the board of the- They brought him on for his, ban his, his banking skills. You know, they, they yeah. need somebody- okay. That's not a direct, you know, contradict. Well, well what's happened to the Silicon Valley Bank assets? I understand they they they're going to sell those to another regional bank. That that's at a big discount. At a big discount. Who'd they sell yeah. to? Who are they selling to? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a it's a bank by the name of First Citizens Bank out of Raleigh, North Carolina, and I Is think they, I think they were. Uh, uh, as I recall from what I read, I think they were like the 30th largest bank in the nation in terms of assets. And with the acquisition of um, Silicon Valley Bank assets, they're now in the top 15, maybe, in terms of asset size. So they got a, they got a great deal, and uh, they've greatly expanded their... Uh, <laughs> the profile they got a huge <laughs> discount on the loans these are just the loans now yeah uh, plus a risk share plus a loss sharing agreement uh from the fdic plus a financing agreement from the fdic so. that that's that that resolution surprises me I, I i was i was much more pessimistic that when the feds took when the fdic took over Silicon Valley Bank, it is one of the most strategic banks in terms of venture capital, um, you know, growth financing. Uh, and interestingly, Silicon Valley also does an awful lot of biz business in China. And they've, they've financed a lot, of, uh, a lot of Chinese operations. So the national security and strategic uh, footprint that Silicon Valley had I would have thought they would have wanted to tuck that into something that they could have had more control over. And I'm surprised that it ends up in a bank in North Carolina. It's outside of my playbook. My playbook had them taking control of those assets. Of course, that's the, I, I, Alex, I guess over all these years, I've become a conspiracy theorist guy, but but it's a theory that pays off so, so richly or so often. I thought they'd want to keep control of Silicon Valley because of its strategic value or tuck it into some place they could rely on like Bank of America where Brian Moynihan is, is totally bought into the, uh, the uh, climate change agenda. So, yeah. Now, one of the criticisms uh, that, uh, that the FDIC has had uh, is that they could have sold the bank earlier, but they were rejecting bids from apparently very legitimate uh, buyers. And um, 
that's that's a question that was being asked in the uh, these recent uh, public hearing congressional hearings at Bruinbury. You know, why were you why were you just um, you know not considering previous bids, previous expressions of, of interest from very legitimate institutional buyers? And uh, I don't think you really answered the question. <laughs> Uh, so there's some questions of why why some initial expressions of interest were ignored, and there's speculation that uh, they were ignored for ideological reasons. Those ideological reasons being that um, the current FDIC board is against, um, you know, the uh, really big, big banks becoming even bigger. Well, that, that I I heard that too. That's but. On the other hand, the big banks, Bank of America in particular, is totally aligned with uh, yeah. with their political agenda. So yeah. they were being a little fussy about this consolidation because I, I think the other thing I worry about, and I, I want to talk about central bank digital currencies, is that my impression is that a lot of people think those 5,000, 4,000 banks we have, well, it's all kind of messy. It'd be much better if it were just consolidated into one federal banking system and be much easier to control, be much easier to, to you know, provide oversight and governance and that sort of thing. And I, I think one scenario is that the, the, there, we're going to see some more bank balance sheets blow up. There'll be some more things come up. And so the next solution on the horizon is going to be, well, wouldn't it be simpler if everybody just banked with the Federal Reserve? And so instead of being the lender of last resort, it becomes the uh, the primary service pro uh, pro provider, financial services provider. And when that happens, it means that our banking accounts are basically going to be an open book to uh, the federal government. In any of its agencies. I, I agree, Bill, and I I'm uh, on record uh, uh, saying that, that this idea of so-called central bank digital currencies or, or making the Fed the bank is the worst financial idea that we've seen in a long time. But could I could I flip back? Because it's, it's all about politics, uh, and, yeah. and all finance is political. In fact, we know that. There is no finance that's not political. Uh, right. uh, but uh, uh, there's, a, there's a great book a few years old uh, uh, by my uh, the principal author, I think it's my friend Charlie Calamiris and a co-author uh, called uh, "Fragile by Design," and and, it, and this book makes the argument that every banking system is a deal between politicians and bankers. And in discussing it, discusses all different countries, but in discussing the United States, it makes the following highly interesting and relevant comment, I think, and that is that the old American political deal was an alliance between rural populists and small banks that kept in all the American, uh, which is fairly, which is unusual in the world, all the American emphasis on small banks, limitation on the uh, geographical presence of banks and so on. They argue that that deal has now been superseded and has been replaced by a deal between urban populists, that is to say left-wing people, and big banks. And the big banks uh, on this theory are happy uh, uh, to play along with the urban populists in order that they get a better deal from their governmental uh, sponsors. I think that's a really interesting idea and plays right into this discussion of what are we observing as we look at the evolution of the system. So the big banks always being, I mean, the banking always being political, but the political, the fundamental political deal has shifted. Uh, that's quite consistent with what, what you were saying. Well, now, just picking, picking up on that, the, you know, the, to, the United States is highly unusual in having 5,000 banks. It used to be 14,000, and it used to be before that, 35,000, and there's all these forces of consolidation at work. Long story about why that's happened. But still, that's an awful lot of banks. You go to France, what, they have three or four banks? Yeah, um, you don't have to go that far. Just go over the northern border to Canada. Okay, yeah. yeah so, but, it, but the... But the, the, the that matter. The, five banks that matter. 
Yeah. Those community banks are the are the sort of the heart of the entrepreneurial uh, small business economy. They provide something like 65, 60, 60, 70 percent of the small commercial real estate loans in America and disproportionate financing to, you know, to smaller businesses and things like that. And I think everybody's had the experience. If you go to the local bank where they know you, you in the old days, you might have a chance to get a loan with the, what do we call it? The guys, the three C's of credit, collateral, uh, character the big one was character your character counted and now and now you're not allowed to use character as a criteria but you know if we get rid if we if we consolidate the banking system into just a few banks i think that's another blow at the heart of uh, of, of entrepreneurship and and civil society in america i agree but think how much worse it is if you consolidate it into one bank yeah. Namely, the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve. <laughs> we're saying yeah. before. So uh, we, uh, in surprise again, uh, Howard Adler and, and I say, look at this incredible irony. The cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and so on, started off as a as an attempt to have money that was outside the government, that was independent of the government and the central banks, and and now it's it's evolved in its own way. Now you have the central bank saying, well, I sort of like this digital currency idea. And the result of this attempt to have an independent money, not part of central banks or not and not part of the government, is to put the government itself into being, namely the central bank as part of the government, into being the issuer of the digital currency. If, if that should happen, there are two uh, uh, terrible results, in my opinion. One is the one you mentioned, the central bank knows everything about you. They're in a perfect position to run a Chinese social score on you. You know, Bill, we don't like the political donations you're giving, so we're just turning your account off. Yeah. Uh, is it easy? For me, that's easy to imagine in the hands of controlling bureaucrats. But the second is, that if you if some large proportion of the deposits, as you could easily think would happen, become deposits of the Fed, those are liabilities. Well, they have to have matching assets. What are the assets going to be? The assets are going to be bonds and loans. So you now have the central bank also in charge of, of credit allocation and all the decisions. And we don't like your business so much, so no, you can't get a loan. It, it's really an appalling possibility to imagine yeah scary you agree steve yeah yeah but uh, i wanted to i wanted to uh bring up a point that uh kevin o'leary made recently uh, kevin o'leary you know he's obviously a very smart guy and i believe he's a conservative uh, i don't know for sure I, I assume he's a conservative but uh he he's raised not the one on, he's not the one on shark tank is he yeah the same guy he's not a conservative <laughs> Okay. <laughs> he, he's, uh, the reason I thought he might be a conservative is he's been appearing on Maria Bartiromo's show recently. Uh, he, he might be. I don't know. He, he's, his politics are hard to discern. But anyway, I'm sorry. Okay. Anyway, the point he was making recently is that uh, there's no reason why the United States needs 4,000 some banks. Well, and yeah, I saw the, that. Pardon me? I, yeah, continue. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just and that uh, there's nothing wrong with just letting market forces work and have a lot of uh, consolidation. And if we ended up with six or seven or eight or nine really large banks, there's nothing wrong with that because, because of technology. And he was saying that uh, people, you know, the newer generation, they don't even really use, you know, uh, uh, bank branches anymore. He, he said he gets questions from young people what what are these bank branches for? Like they don't even need see a need for bank branches. So he was making the point that um, with the advance of technology and people really increasingly doing all their financial transactions online, that you don't need four thousand some banks, and there's nothing wrong with having you know seven or eight or nine. Well, really well large I I heard him I heard him say the same thing. I, my okay. my reaction well, he I don't think he's conservative, but he's no friend of freedom. Because, you know, that's really sort of a Silicon Valley master of the universe view where, you know, why do we need all these other players there? You know, I, 
I guess I'm sort of a radical decent. I mean, this is just my personal philosophy, radical decentralization, where lots of things, different things happen, and there's no central governing authority for all our economic and political activity. And I think what he's talking about leads to the thing Alex was saying is that once you get this consolidated, it's a whole lot easier to watch uh, what people are doing. So I heard that and I, th I, I, I wanted to throw something at the TV. <laughs> But, but I'm, I'm curious what Alex, uh, Alex, what, what do you think about what Kevin? Yeah, Aberry... yeah let's, let's kick it. I, you know, I, I, I'm happy to have a different point of view, but. <laughs> all, uh, all finance is political, as I said, so you, that will be a political, there'll be a heavy uh, political uh, force in whatever the outcome is, uh, it, it, unless you had a truly radical remapping of the financial system, which we won't get. Uh, what would a market, what would a true market outcome be? My guess it would be uh, there would be more uh, consolidation as we've already had and big banks, but there would also be a whole lot of small uh, uh, sp geographically specialized uh, banks that actually care about your character, as we were saying a minute ago and who you are. So uh, I, I agree with Bill I that the the only a few big banks govern, you know, sitting together, palsy wellsy uh, in Washington uh, with the politicians uh, is the vision uh, uh, that I would would not support. And I guess that if you if you had something like a real market outcome, it would have a lot of a lot of smaller uh, organizations in it as well. Well, remember when we thought the internet was going to bring this incredible rich ability to communicate with all sorts of different people and it would be just sort of the greatest friend to intellectual liberty ever and instead it evolved because of the monopoly of google and some others it evolved into this, this thing we're fighting now where you've got all this viewpoint discrimination and instead of becoming the wild west of ideas it's they've all been attempted to shut down and they can do it because of uh AI and, and other other algorithms to uh, shadow ban and keep people off. I worry about the same thing, if, you know, in banking, which is where if you've got it centralized in the wrong hands, that, that could be a real weapon. And the wrong hands are bound to occur. There was a, yeah. a wonderful uh, hearing by the uh, Treasury Committee, I think they call it, or the Finance Committee of the House of Lords in England. Uh, with the governor of the Bank of England, and the Bank of England was pushing a kind of uh, central bank digital currency. The House of Lords has in it a couple of retired governors, I guess, of the Bank of England who have now become Lord somebody. So it was it was a highly uh, knowledgeable panel. And at one point, they got on the issue of whether the central bank digital currency would interfere with personal freedom and with privacy. And the governor of the Bank of England said to the House, said to the Lords assembled, I have no interest in knowing what anybody's personal payments are. And the chairman of the committee said, I believe you when you say you don't, but how about your successor sure. or one of your successors? Right. It seems to me uh, inevitable the political outcome that someday someone will be there who will have a very high interest uh, in controlling your personal transactions, just like Bill said, we find we have a high interest in controlling uh, controlling whatever you're posting on the internet or whatnot. Speech. I, I thought that was a, a wonderful response on, on, yeah. in the House of Lords. How would we, we've, I, I'm just checking my timer here. I, I lost track. This is so interesting. Uh, <laughs> We got to we got to wrap it up though in the interest of keeping it under an hour. How do we head off a of central bank digital currency? And 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 it's, I think Alex and I, Steve, sort of feel. How do you feel about C CBDC? Oh me? Yeah. Oh, I'm totally hundred percent opposed. Then how do we stop it? How do we how do we head this this evil thing off at the pass? Uh. Well, it's it's. I think it's you know it leads to politics. Um, I think we just have to 
you know, politics, uh, how you vote is determined. Well, 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 well what we're doing, what I'm doing is I'm using my show and every other forum I've got to, to bring this up as an issue. And I, when people starting to talk about the financial crisis, that's one of the reasons I wanted you guys on today. Yeah. They have to understand the political dimensions of this. And this is not just, oh, money. No, it's about politics and it's about freedom. And I think if we raise awareness about central bank digital currency, we got some chance of stopping it. That's yeah. my strategy at this point. Nothing, nothing more sophisticated than that. Alex, what do you think? I, I agree. That's what you have to do, as in any uh, political situation. And it clearly is deeply political, as we're all saying. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I was trying to actually advance the, uh, the, you know, the public attention to opposition to CBDCs myself with one of my Bastiat Society events last year. I had uh, Norbert Michel uh, as a featured speaker, and Norbert spoke. Well, good. Norm's normally he's coming on here in two weeks, so or maybe next okay. week. You know. Yeah. Anyway, keep going. Sorry. Yeah. So I had uh, Norbert Michel on as a featured speaker specifically to talk about the danger, uh, the dangers of CBDCs, about them taking away our freedoms. Look, this is a good time for for ads, for promotion. <laughs> <laughs> You're running the Bastiat Society of DC, and what are your other affiliations, Steve? Uh, well, I've, uh, I've started becoming active as a writer on Substack and, uh, sure. more recently, uh, with the American Spectator and Foundation for Economic Education. Where can we find you? You're at, uh, are you on Twitter? Yeah, well, yeah, uh, I actually have it under a uh, entity named Geofinancial Trends. <laughs> Geofinancial you, 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 can, you can do better than that. <laughs> I actually developed a website, Geofinancial Trends, but I just haven't, <laughs> haven't launched it yet. I'm just, that'd be a good name for a firm, but maybe not the Twitter handle. I don't know. Who knows? Could be. Yeah, but I, I think these, to answer your question, I think the easiest way, uh, you can find me on Substack. Just do a search for right. Steve on Substack. Okay. Yeah. And Alex, my my forever, you know, Alex, I've got a, I've still got a, files that you you know articles you've written and given me for the years and it my file cabinet of articles from uh, from alex pollack or at least the pile of them is about three or four feet tall now because we've been doing this back and forth forever you're now writing it at, at with the mises institute yeah, it's the ludwig von mises ludwig. <laughs> ludwig von mises who is a great the the uh one of the founders of the Austrian School of Economics, yeah, uh, marked by a love of freedom and a suspicion of central banks. That institute, I, I'm very active with the Federalist Society as well, which has yeah. many events. And you can find my work, should anyone wish to, at alexjpollock.com. Okay, well, we're we're set for our next show, and we'll lots of dangling things here, and lots of follow up to come. Uh, this has been the Bill Walton Show, and I've been here with Alex Pollock and Steve Dewey. We've been talking about uh, what led us up to the Silicon Valley situation and where this is going to go from here. In particular, we're asking all of you to get knowledgeable about central bank digital currencies and and uh, do everything you can to, to prevent the politicians from bringing those about. Uh, anyway, thanks for joining. As, as always, you, you, know, you can find our show on, on YouTube, Rumble, Substack. Uh, we're on all the major podcast platforms. We're on CPAC now on, on Monday nights and, and a lot of other platforms. And, and please send us your comments about shows you'd like us to and topics you'd like to be covering and guests you'd like to have on. Um, we pay a lot of attention and, and your thoughts uh, matter a lot. And uh, we like to think of this as a collaboration of kindred spirits. So uh, anyway, thanks for joining. And uh, thanks, Alex. And thanks, Steve. And we'll talk with you all uh, next time. All right. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Bill. That was, that was great. That was fun. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read everyone and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, 
what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.